Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with WIPB-TV and Indiana Public Radio at Ball State University. Today we are chatting with Julie Borgman, Executive Director of the Red Tail Land Conservancy. Julie has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. Thank you, Julie, for joining us today. My pleasure. So talk about Red Tail Conservancy, talk about land trusts in general and their mission and why they are so valuable to the people here in the Muncie area? Well, land trusts operate across the United States, and in general, the land trusts, um, since they've been in existence, actually have protected more land in the contiguous United States, actually double the amount of land that exists in our national park system. So we're providing a vital function to protect and preserve land across the country, but Redtail works here in East Central Indiana. We're what's known as a regional land trust. So we work to uh, protect and preserve and restore critical natural areas like woods and wetlands, places where wildlife need to exist, uh, as well as places for people in our community to get out and reconnect with nature. There's a frequent misconception that land trusts and protection is protection from, protection from people, protection from use, but it is not protection from, it's protection for. We need watershed, we need these natural environments, in part because our agriculture depends on the health of our natural environments. Exactly, and, and you know, when we talk about uh, protecting, permanently protecting places where wildlife can thrive. It's actually places where people thrive as well because we're wildlife, we're mammals. We need clean air, we need you know a reliable food source, we need clean water. And so we're actually protecting places where people can thrive as well. And a lot of times it's a misconception about development versus what we're doing to protect. And we don't oppose development, we just want smart development and we wanna protect those critical areas that once a bulldozer comes through, you can't ever restore that wetland and, and that habitat and those, you know, the biodiversity that exists there. It's also been explained to me by ranchers and, and uh, farmers working at different scales that um, the, the connection between the agricultural uh, areas and the wildlife areas um, are uh, become very obvious when you work the land and that and that uh, maintaining a balance, uh, even in, uh, to the point of maintaining a balance within the soil, to ensure that, that the land is healthy and holistically managed is so important to its use by, by all users. Exactly, I mean, healthy soils is one of our richest uh, natural resources that we have. And it, it's not something that will always be there if we don't protect it and take care of it. So protecting our watersheds, having buffers along where crops are grown in between you know, our rivers and streams, and doing everything we can to help protect agricultural land as well as the forests and wetlands. And, so talk about how the organization was formed, how it came together, because it's an interesting story and, and, and the, the idea of protection really grew from the interior on out. It was not imposed, it was a sensibility that, that developed and then action was taken. Yeah, and Red Tail came about, um, we're actually getting celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. And there were land trusts existing in Indiana uh, prior to Red Tail's coming about. And it was a grassroots group of people, about 87 people that got together at Minnetrista Cultural Center um, and saw a real need here to protect things locally. So land trusts were working in the, in the the um, across Indiana, but, uh, there, it, there was a statement, a quote made at one point that some of the organizations felt that East Central Indiana was devoid of significant natural resources, you know, which bottom line meant they didn't feel there was a lot here to protect. And um, people here in our community felt there were important places that needed protecting. And so Red Tail Conservancy, Land Conservancy came about through a grassroots meeting of people who thought something needed to be done locally uh, by people in our communities, not people, you know, in outside communities like Fort Wayne or Indian Annapolis. And since that time, we've protected over 2,700 acres of woods and agricultural land as well as wetlands. So I think we proved our point so far, as well as the fact that we work hard to connect people in those communities to these natural areas. And, and so it was important to have a more local, regional land trust working. Let's categorize those 2,700 acres um, into the types of lands that you protect and also how they came to uh, transition into a land trust status and what that actually means. Yeah, so the land that we protect, it's protected forever. And that's something that's kind of cool, I think, you know, um, 
it, politics, government, people in charge can change, um, but when it's the land's held by a land conservancy, you know that land is protected forever. We do it through a couple of different ways. We do it through purchasing the land, acquiring it, and the organization owns the land, and those lands are turned into nature preserves, some of which we open to the public with trails for access if we feel like it's in the land's best interest. And then other places, we've worked with landowners who want to retain private ownership of the land. But for example, it's a family farm. I've heard this story several times. You know, it's a family farm that's been in their family for generations, and they just don't know with future generations if, if they're gonna continue to farm it. But by doing a conservation easement, that document restricts the deed so that land has to stay in production or as you know a woodlands um, and stays protected so that it can't be sold off and developed down the road. It also has tax advantages in it terms does. of moving it into an easement status, and it allows the family continu to continue their their traditional business model, but now not burdened by the by as as many financial burdens as if it would stay in private private hands. Yeah, exactly. And they know beyond their existence that um, the organization will be there ensuring that the um, easement restrictions are upheld. We go out at least once a year and monitor those properties to make sure that that easement's being upheld and that the land's being used in a conservation manner. Now, you referred to this decision process of, of figuring out whether land should be open to human use or not for the good of the land, but the, for the good of the land actually has a specific definition. Talk about what that actually means and what your criterion are that would allow for use, but also prohibit use of certain tracts. We work with um, our board of directors and works with other scientific people in the community. Um, there are certain parts of the land. We, we've got a property that we recently purchased, uh, for example, that has a heron rookery on it. And if there's a lot of disturbance of the area of that wetland where the heron rookery is, the herons will move on and, and won't nest there any longer. And so that's a great example where our board um, decided we want the public to be able to use that property from time to time. So we'll do guided hikes there, but we won't have just open um, uh, use of the property where there would be disturbance or there might be land where the land isn't suitable to put in a trail and it'd be really expensive to put in boardwalks and things to maintain and so or there might be really fragile plant communities where it's just you know humans can have a much heavier impact on the land and so we just deem um, through our resources and experts that that's just not a good place to have access. And then the other thing is um, sometimes we purchase a woods and in order to have public access, we need a parking lot. And so we have to have land that's suitable to even put in a parking lot where people can safely get in and out of, of the nature preserve. And obviously we don't cut down trees to put in parking lots. So. How do you go about what you do um, so that it is informed by uh, current thinking in the field um, and, and uh, also takes into account the needs and sensibilities of people locally? Sometimes it's easy when you work in an environmental field to kind of end up in mission drift. And because everything's interrelated, it's easy, it's easy to kind of get taken down different paths. So we, um, with regard to certain things like organic farming and buffer strips and pesticide use, on the lands that we own where there may be agricultural production, we um, work with the farmers who are farming that land to use best management practices. Um, and we try and partner with other organizations like soil and water conservation districts. That's kind of more what they do in terms of educating agricultural producers. So it's a partnership where these topics are discussed, but there's not a prescriptive approach. I exactly, and we'll try and make sure we do best management practices on, on our land, but it's easy to kind of get mission drift, and so we try and stay really focused in, in terms of what we're doing. Um, recently, there's some new work being done to put in new electrical lines, and, and so we're trying to work with those corridors and the easements of the gas companies and the electric companies as they go through our land to look at doing some um, corridors and plannings of, normally they have to go through and every three years basically clear cut everything, and then it's spraying of lots of herbicides, which is really obviously not 
good for the environment and we don't want to see it happen on the land that we own, but in a lot of cases, these easements already exist. So we're trying to work with the utility companies in our area to work on some new vegetative management practices. So looking at planting um, plants um, that attract pollinators and are much better for the environment, don't require them to come in and then use lots of pesticides and herbicides and things like that to clear out underneath these electrical lines or over these gas lines. So trying to do some, um, some innovative practices on the land that we own that can hopefully then be pilot projects for the, you know, throughout the community. Um, but again, we try and stay really focused on preserving and protecting you know, natural areas. And what's next for the uh, Red Tail Land Conservancy? We're in the process of developing a strategic conservation plan and being um, more proactive and going after um, some really fragile environments that are important that we get protected, um, expanding some of our current properties because um, larger tracks are better for wildlife and habitat, so we wanna work to expand those and connect those to other public lands or privately protected lands. Um, but a huge thing is in our mission, if we don't connect people to the work that we're doing, um, it, it won't be relevant in coming years because it, it's, it's obvious with technology in our society and screens, people are less and less connected to the natural world. So um, it's really important for us. A lot of the places we're protecting these critical, fragile habitats are not near where people live. 80% right. you know, of the people in our country live in cities. And so it's important for us to develop um, some more um, urban nature preserves. We're trying to work and maybe have ambassador properties that are closer to where people live so that people can get out and, and experience nature and then hopefully become more connected to it, learn more about it and care more to protect it. What an important mission to conserve land, to protect land to ensure that it is used in a way that maintains its character for the community, to also provide educational experiences and connect people to the land and the wildlife on the land. Julie Borgman, thank you so much for sharing the work of Red Tail Land Conservancy, and thank you so much for your insights. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for helping us get awareness out about what we do. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. <laughs>